Hi. In this video, I would like to talk about model confidence. And in doing so, I also hope to talk a little bit about algorithm design. After all, there is more to an algorithm than just the accuracy scores that come out of it. And it's this design aspect that deserves to get a little bit extra attention. Now, to be specific, I will be discussing the diet architecture that we are using in Raza. And I'll also be talking about a small improvement that the research team has recently made. I will, however, only zoom in on a very specific portion of the algorithm, namely just this bit. If you're a little bit unfamiliar with diet, however, you don't have to worry because what I'll be talking about here is something that's a little bit more general than just our specific implementation. So let's zoom in on what I mean by that. Now, at the very end of our classification algorithm, we have two embeddings. One embedding belongs to the utterance that the user has just mentioned, and the other embedding belongs to a intent label. And yes, there's an entire process that happens before these two embeddings. Specifically here, we've got a transformer layer in front, but let's ignore all of those details for now. I'm talking about a neural network here where the label is encoded in an embedding and I've got a representation of text that needs to be classified. Then a typical architecture choice would be to say, well, let's take those two embeddings. Let's then calculate a similarity between these two embeddings. And then we might use this to calculate a specific loss value. Now, when you look at just this part of the architecture, you might not be entirely impressed. After all, it's just two dense layers that are performing a embedding, as well as a similarity. But you'd be mistaken if you were to take this for granted. Because we're at the end of our algorithm here, we can assume that the labels and predictions are going to be mapped together at exactly this point of the algorithm. It's from here where we can expect gradient updates to happen, which will propagate back to our embedding layers but also everything else before. And with that in mind, I do hope it's very clear that the choice of the similarity measure, as well as the choice of our loss over here, will have a very significant effect on everything that is happening. Now this observation allows us to take a step back and to really ask ourselves the question, what properties we're interested in here? And of course, one property here would be to say, well, we wanna have high accuracy. That's of course still valid, but maybe it's easier to reason about the properties that we're interested in if we consider these two embedding layers and what they will do. By zooming in on what's happening there, we might be able to make some good algorithmic design decisions. Now, I'll make a low dimensional analogy of what we might wanna have in our embedded space. What the embeddings will do is they will map labels and utterances into some high dimensional plane. I'm not able to draw in a high dimensional plane, so let's just pretend like we have two dimensional embeddings and we can then start to wonder what sort of properties we would really like to see in them. And let's have this blue dot be the current utterance. Let's have this green dot be the correct label. And let's have this red one over here be the incorrect one. Well, what I hope you would agree is that if there is a embedding over here for the correct label, then you would hope that the embedding for the current utterance is close to it. You would really like this distance to be small. You would also hope though, that the distance from the current utterance to an incorrect embedding, that that is big. And now that I'm thinking about this, I hope you also agree that we would really like the distance from the correct intent to a incorrect intent to also be big. And now that I'm thinking further, I think you would want to have the distance between all embedding labels to be big. And we can also imagine that if we have an utterance that doesn't belong to the current label, that we would also like that distance to be big. Looking at this, you might be reminded of the star space algorithm. And you would be completely correct if you were to point out that in order to get to these similarities over here, we would have to do some negative sampling of both intents as well as utterances. 
However, the main conclusion I hope you have at this point is that it deserves to think about what similarities we will be applying. The type of similarity measure, as well as the loss function that might follow, will have a huge impact on the embedded space that we will end up with. And this embedded space at the final edge of our algorithm will have a huge impact on the predictions that go out of the model. But the impact really goes beyond accuracy. Because if I think about what I'm interested in in the model, it really isn't just accuracy, it's also if we have a good measure of confidence. Whenever we make a prediction, we would like to have a reliable confidence measure. And how do we get this reliable confidence measure? Well, by thinking about what similarities mean in this embedded space. And with that in mind, let's zoom in on how we might be able to translate similarities in this embedded space into a confidence measure that the model outputs. If we think very carefully about this, we might get a very nice property indeed. So let's think about ways how we might get embeddings like drawn below into something of a confidence measure. Typically, when you have embeddings, you can think of them as vectors. Let's say I've got this vector from the origin to my utterance embedding. Then in this case, I might be able to calculate a similarity by calculating the dot product between this vector and for all of the vectors belonging to all of the intents. I would calculate the dot product between u and intent number two. I would also do that between u and intent number one and between u and intent number three. Now, a thing to remember with these distances is that they don't necessarily represent a probability. We have a dot product and this dot product is theoretically unbounded. And even if I were to pick another distance measure like cosine distance, then sure, I would have a distance measure that isn't so much bounded, but it still wouldn't represent a probability. So commonly what people would do is they would take a distance measure like dot product, and they would pass that through some sort of activation layer. One popular candidate would be to pass it through the sigmoid function. And the idea here is that indeed we can map any values between zero and one. However, if you start looking at the sigmoid function critically, then you might notice a few oddities. Let's say I have a dot product of minus four and another dot product of minus three. And I'm going to compare that to two other dot products, one of negative dot five and one of plus dot five. Well then, in both scenarios, we have the same difference in embedded space as far as similarity is concerned. But if I were to actually compare the difference in the output of the sigmoid, then I hope you would agree that this difference in similarity doesn't equally translate into a difference in confidence. If we're measuring near zero, then odds are that we're going to see a much bigger difference compared to if we were on the outskirts. And if we were to take somewhat extreme values here, let's say that we are comparing plus 10 with plus 15, well, then we get this awkward scenario where there's barely any difference at all. Even if in embedded space, we would argue that we have a difference in similarity that's quite high, this wouldn't automatically translate into a difference of similarity as far as the sigmoid is concerned. So this might make you wonder, well, is the sigmoid here really appropriate? Is the output here really a measure for confidence? And this might make you consider, well, let's do something else than sigmoid. Let's take another popular choice. Let's go for softmax. Softmax is a popular final layer. And a property that this one has is that it can translate inputs to something that sums up to one. However, here, if we have a sequence of similarities, let's say an array with ones. And if I were to compare that to another array, again, where we might have similarities, but all of these would have a higher number, then the softmax effectively considers them equivalent. Now, I hope you would agree that all this activation business is a little bit awkward because these probability values matter when we are interested in triggering a fallback. We would really like to have a mechanism 
that can translate the output of a machine learning model into a value for confidence. And maybe now we can ask a very good critical question. Can't we just use these embedding similarities directly as a confidence measure? Maybe we shouldn't transform these similarities so much. Maybe just a linear normalization will be enough to quantify model confidence. We have been researching exactly this question. Are we better off if we quantify confidence in a different way? To explain the main result, let's have a look at these two charts. What you're looking at is one of the confidence charts that are generated when you run Raza test. The idea is that we see some confidence numbers over here on this axis. And these can be used to quantify how confident we are when we make a correct prediction. And we can compare that to how confident we are when we make a wrong prediction. What you can see from this chart is that we are indeed really confident whenever we make a correct prediction, which is good. However, we are also really confident when we make a wrong prediction, which is something we would not want. This chart was made by using the softmax normalization setting. And what we're going to do now is we're going to compare that to the linear normalization, which you see listed here. It's the same chart ran on the same data set, but you can clearly see how our confidence scores have shifted. When we are wrong, we certainly seem to be less certain about it. We are able to quantify that in this new measure for confidence. The reason why this is so interesting is that this allows us to perhaps come to a more meaningful fallback threshold. In a situation before, it will be quite tricky to come up with a sensible threshold, whereas in this new situation, finding a more meaningful threshold should be a whole lot easier. When you're doing this exercise yourself, do keep in mind that the axes that you see on the bottom here aren't the same. But having said that, we are pretty excited about this new linear normalization for confidence. In our research, we have found that it's much easier to come to a sensible fallback threshold like you see here. But it's not just for fallback thresholds that this new confidence measure is interesting. You'll notice that we also have a couple of examples of the green bars that have a low confidence as well. These green bars might represent examples that have a lot of spelling errors, for example. The thing with these green bars as well is that if these green bars were to happen in practice on new training data coming in, that even though if we get our algorithm to make the correct prediction, that we might still want to give these examples priority when it comes to labeling. So that means that this is also a great feature when you're trying to do conversation-driven development. If you are interested in trying out this new feature, what you can do is you can set the model confidence to linear norm. When you do this, you get this new confidence measure that should make it easier for you to find a appropriate threshold for the fallback classifier. You can find more information in the documentation itself, but it's good to also observe that these settings can also be configured for the TED policy, as well as for the response selector. These algorithms all share a common implementation, so that means you can also experiment with these new confidence measurements for these two components as well.